Hello, hello. I think it's something in the 
That's the life field in the gym. All right, I think we're set to go. Can you hear more? You want that? Yeah. Right. Uh, you want me to do it there? Whatever you like. Both the good ones. Be sure to, you know, stage man. Um, so it's all going now. You, you do it? Yes. Yeah. 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 No, don't push me. Good evening, everybody. Um, just have your attention for the moment. Housekeeping. Just to let you know that there's toilets at the end of the corridor door at the store, follow a corridor down for so many meters. The exits here, if we have an issue that needs uh, vacating the place, then exit up there and off out the store here. So um, I hope you enjoy this evening. Um, especially I'd like to uh, welcome Jan and David Fullerton and uh, Roger and Alex Miller, um, uh, Holmes Miller's son and daughter. Um, welcome to our 23rd um, lecture, Sir Holmes Miller uh, Memorial Lecture. Holmes Miller was born after the First World War and he found himself in the Second World War. And after the war was over and that, and he completed his studies and became the surveyor that he is, uh, that he was, and uh, with uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and a number of other people, they established and put a stake in the ground at Scott Base. And Scott Base become, became the uh, future home for many um, graduates, and scientists who had the inclination to um, be conservationists and to look after the future of uh, Antarctica and New Zealand. I was in Antarctica and I was fortunate to meet Sir Holmes Miller, who by the way, his name was changed during the Second World War, it wasn't his choice, but it became Bob Miller. When I met him, he was Bob Miller. And the thing that I always remember about him was, nice man, very encouraging. And on one occasion, he came through the kitchen and said to me, excuse me, son, how would you like to speak to your mother and father? Now, this is 1962, and I said, you've got to be joking. He said, no, come with me. So he went through to the radio shack, and he put on some earphones, and he dialed some things, and then he said, now, dial your home number. So I dialed my home number, and there was my mother on the other end of the phone. Now, how exciting was that for a 17? I just turned 17, and you've got to remember that within the five-year time frame prior to that, we were only starting to get phones in our homes 
and fridges. And so my memories of um, Sir Holmes Miller, Bob Miller, is way up there. So without ado, I'd like to ask our patron, Peter Barrett, to step forward and introduce our lecturer for the evening. Thank you. What do you want to use here? Yeah. Thanks very much, Mori. Um, and um, yeah, I just reflect on my uh, time in Antarctic where I just missed meeting Bob Miller because uh, he was in the field when we arrived and he was still in the field when we left. But uh, he was an amazing guy. Well, um, I'm now going to be introducing uh, Colin Monteith, someone that I've known and admired for uh, since about the most first, uh, first met in the mid 70s. And in those days, those post IGY days, the science was done largely by the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. And the government provided the clothing and the gear. And especially those early mapping parties and exploration parties uh, like Bob organised. Uh, but the universities had to provide their own clothing. They were latecomers to the party. And um, when Colin joined Antarctic Division in 1973 as field operations officer, we could see we were struggling a bit, but he had his own mountaineering experience and he provided better gear than we could. And he successfully uh, made the case for all parties going into the field to have the same gear. So we're very grateful to you, Colin. Colin began a special relationship with Erebus, uh, now a book, and the topic of this lecture in his first Antarctic field season. And I have to mention there was some good fortune when he met a university student that season who had failed his first year subjects in science, but was considered a worthy rascal by his professor and encouraged to go on in geology. And some of us in this room uh, understand what it is like to, we didn't get quite there, but uh, Dave and I were close. Um, so this guy, for his PhD, led the first expedition to study Erebus as a volcano. He gathered world experts through the 1970s. He went on to lead over 40 expeditions in total. His name is, of course, Philip Kyle. He's one of our most productive and colourful alumni, uh, but just a small part of tonight's story. The, Colin was a key figure in organising those early Erebus expeditions through the 1970s that allowed him to uh, climb and photograph and uh, support other science projects throughout the Transantarctic Mountains. And of course, he loved it. But um, he decided he should broaden his experience and go freelance. And as a consequence, over 30 years, he's developed a reputation as a world-class photographer, alpinist, guide, with many projects as a result. So Colin, the Erebus book has been the greatest thus far, combining a lifetime of experience and your passion for history and uh, your eye for striking imagery. So now we're going to hear your introduction to this book and the project. Thank you. I think this is the best mic. Can you hear me okay up the back? Here are folks. Yeah. I think I'll hold this one in case I wander around. Well, it's a privilege to be here, and I spent an exciting day up with Peter up at uh, the Antarctic Research Centre, celebrating its 50 years, of course, and there's more than that of Victoria University expeditions, but 50 years of the specific Antarctic Research Centre is a, a great milestone, and it was it was just wonderful to see the staff involved and having smoko and lunch and just the energy and talking about a big traverse they're doing across the Ross Ice Shelf this season for uh, drilling uh, underneath uh, part of the Ross Ice Shelf. 
So it's uh, it's fantastic. Um, so I used to come to Wellington as part of my field operations job because there was a, re a Ross Dependency Research Committee then, of which Bob Miller, of course, was the chairman. So my job was the, the meat in the sandwich between the science and the logistics, and I had to convince uh, the science committees that, that what Antarctic Division in Christchurch was capable of or not capable of, because in those days the vehicle and air support that we had was very, very limited. So uh, as Peter said, it was a great job because it was a, a job in the office in Christchurch during the winters, but in the summer I could go down to Scott Base and help the leader run the base, and I had a great excuse to go out with field parties just for three days or three weeks or whatever. So in 75 I chose to join Phil Kyle, 75, 76, and then 78 when I went into the inner crater of Arab um, yeah, fantastic job. And uh, the beauty of that job was that it, it, it meant that I was, in theory, a better administrator the following winter uh, in the office. And in those days, we employed between eight and 14 mountaineers every year to support science. Um, and we gave those people, and it was an unwritten rule, that they could go out and climb mountains because it didn't get dark, of course. So as long as they're back at work by 8 o'clock the next morning. And that gave them the confidence in a new environment as well. And I think the New Zealand safety record in Antarctica speaks well for that policy. Um, so I've had 32 summers in Antarctica, and I went freelance in 1983 as a photographer, and we ran a photo library supplying photographs to publishers all over the world, based in Christchurch with several staff, representing 200 photographers. Uh, published a number of books, and Erebus is the, my 13th book, I think, but but whatever. I went freelance and started working for a variety of, of adventure companies, some of them aircraft-based and most of them ship-based. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we started working with small uh, Soviet vessels uh, that uh, turned into Russian vessels. It's a memorable occasion, but small passenger ships that took 50 passengers and 20 crew. And it was fantastic working with the Russians in the, in the polar regions. Um, and eventually we started sea kayaking, skin diving, and climbing uh, small mountains as well on the, on the Antarctic Peninsula. And the, then we started crossing South Georgia on Shackleton's route. So that was terrific, and that went on for 30-odd years. But I eventually decided that I wasn't... Uh, guiding is, is really easy when everything goes right, but it's when things go wrong that you need to have extra skills and extra strength in the tank. And I eventually decided to, to stop Antarctic tourism. It was starting to accelerate, and the ships were getting bigger. The Russian ships had run out of their life, and the bigger ships were coming in, and I stepped right out of it. But um, I just wasn't handling ropes enough, and I d decided I couldn't handle crevasse rescue. So, um, But anyway, I got an invitation um, that I couldn't turn down from an English mountaineer, Stephen Venables, to go on a yacht, and I'd always wanted to go by yacht to Antarctica. So uh, that was in 2020, and that was a ski expedition on the Antarctic Peninsula with eight clients, four of them Swiss, four of them British. But anyway, we just snuck back into, into Chile as it was shutting down for COVID, and I... I'm lucky to get back into Christchurch as we shut down. And I thought, well, I actually started a book on Erebus in the early 1980s, uh, shortly after the air crash, but I very quickly pulled out of it because there was a, a plethora of other books came out specifically on the Air New Zealand crash. And I just pulled right out altogether and went on other expeditions and, and started into other books. So I thought when I came back from this yachting expedition, I thought, well, I've got all the I've got all the material here. I've got interviews with people like Phil Kyle and the Frenchman Harun Taziev that you'll meet. Um, and I thought, well, all the materials there in my personal reference library. Why don't I have a go at it? I'm just amazed that nobody else has picked up the gauntlet, if you like, and there's 180 plus years of human history uh, to do with Erebus. And I thought, well, let's give it a go. And uh, so it, it's my so-called COVID project, if you like. And uh, it's taken two years to write the book and then another year to, for Massey University Press to go through the editing and uh, design process. So it's been, a, it's been a great project. So I just make sure I get the right clickers here. So Scott Base you're familiar with. In fact, this is one of the most recent images that I could find. No smoke coming out of Erebus at the time, but I just thought I'd put it in as the as the title page of the book because it will be the last view you see of that base. In fact, it, it has already changed. Last summer, they took down the aircraft hangar that dates back to the 1950s. The first few chapters of the book really orient. Uh, it's, it's a book designed for a general reader, so it covers human history and, of course, the, the modern, right through to the modern science. And everybody asked me, oh, is it going to be a book specifically on the air crash? Well, yes, inescapably, there is a chapter on the air crash. But, um, so, but just to remind you that it, it very definitely is a very real volcano um, with its name dating back to Greek mythology, the son of chaos, uh, so Erebus erupts between once and five times every day. And so it's a very active lava lake. 
Uh, yeah, so th these fumarole towers, there's about 250 of them in the summit caldera of, of Erebus, and you can see them with the naked eye from Scott Base. They're up to 15, 20 metres high, and they eventually fall over um, just with gravity. as they, they gradually grow, and it's a hollow chimney releasing gases, of course. But you'll see that the book is dedicated to three Wellington fellows, Werner Gigenbach and uh, Ray Dibble, scientists that I work with in the mid-1970s. Uh, who are gone now, are passionate scientists and worked very, very hard in what is a very difficult environment at, at a higher altitude than Mount Cook. And uh, Tony Taylor was a psychologist here in Wellington who worked in New Zealand prisons a lot, but he was a major counsellor to the New Zealand Antarctic Research Program, looking after the, the psychology of the winter cruise, but also, of course, after the, the air crash, he was uh, a significant counsellor for the staff at Antarctic Division that still had to keep Scott Base running. A difficult time. And Garth Varko, that I worked with for many years, uh, helped to recreate the base um, from its IGY origins. Uh, he, he, he was a building and service officer at the Antarctic Division. He died in a helicopter crash at the base of Mount Erebus some years ago now. Yep. But as I say, the first few chapters just to orient you to the scale of Ross Island because it's, uh, it's hard to, to grasp just how big an island it is. And you can see in the far right of the picture there just a faint sun glowing on the, the secondary volcano there of Mount Terra. So the top picture there gives you McMurdo Base on the left-hand side and Scott Base is on the far, far right on the little peninsula. And I thought the bottom picture was worth including, I don't like Antarctic photographs with flags in them, but this one was inescapable because it does show the, the glow from the lava lake under the steam plume there with winter lights from McMurdo on the left and Scott Base on the right. Uh, aerial photograph on the top it does give you a good feel for uh, the scale of Ross Island with Mount Bird, the dormant volcano out on the far left. Uh, the helicopter there has landed on the summit of, of Mount Terra. Um, so you're looking uh, across to Erebus in the background there. And I, I put this one in the book because it shows on the very far right of the picture there, Beaufort Island, which is a very crucial part of the Air New Zealand crash story. So it gives you a feeling for there's Lewis Bay there where the aircraft crashed. Um, Antarctica has well over 100 volcanoes. Um, and this chapter outlines the... the uh, the nature of these volcanoes. You, you're, you're familiar with the Pacific Ring of Fire where you've got continents uh, subducting underneath each other, causing volcanoes from Kam uh, Kamchatka, Japan, in, down in through Indonesia, into New Guinea and into New Zealand. Well, if you keep on going south from there, you come to, to Antarctica, obviously, and it's a very different sort of scenario there. It's a, it's a it's a continent twice the size of, of Australia, and it's, uh, it's sitting on a continental plate, which is twice as big again. But it's it's like the East African rift system. Antarctica is tearing itself apart, and it's down this rift, West Antarctic rift system, it's called, with its weakness where lava is forced up to the surface. So quite a number of the volcanoes are subsurface under the Ross Sea, um, but, of course, the, the central island of Ross Island is the prominent um, Erebus, the most active in, on the continent. But you keep on going through that rift system down into the West Antarctic ice cap, and you've got uh, major volcanoes uh, there in Marie Birdland, many of which don't actually breach the, 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 the actual ice cap itself. I don't know. How do we get rid of this silly... <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yep. It just gives you a feel for a uh, US uh, Basler aircraft that is needed for land on skis out in West Antarctic ice cap under these big volcanoes. So you can see Mount Takahi there on the bottom right, um, a very, very large volcano just breaching the, the surface of 2,000 feet of ice. Continue on past West Antarctic ice cap ice sheet, and you head up into the Antarctic Peninsula, and it's a, it's a different set of volcanoes altogether, with um, small small plates that are riding over each other in the South Shetland Islands. So this is one of the most famous volcanoes in Antarctica, is Deception Island or Horseshoe Island, which has been used for many years as a safe anchorage for uh, whaling ships and uh, and still science vessels today. But it's it's erupted very violently, destroying two Antarctic bases uh, in the 1960s. And uh, these days, tourists can go there and swim in the hot water. 
continue on up past South Georgia through the Scotia Arc, again, you've got small plates, small continental plates riding over each other to create uh, 11 volcanoes, the South Sandwich Islands, which were first discovered by Captain Cook in the 1770s. And he discovered about seven of them. But the cloud was obviously very down very low, and he didn't actually recognise them as volcanoes. Um, but that was as far south as he went on that, on that voyage, and he was plagued by bad weather, big icebergs, and remember, of course, he had no engines on his ships. But uh, 40 or 50 years later, uh, the Russian navigator Bellinghausen came along in better weather, and he, dis he named and discovered uh, another four of the islands, and he certainly recognised some of the ones that Cook had discovered and recognised them very definitely as, uh, as active volcanoes. Uh, so the, uh, these, it's very north of the Antarctic um, Treaty Zone. It's, uh, it's in, the, in the 50s latitude, but it's still south of the, the biological conversion zone. To me, so to me, it's not sub-Antarctic. It's still technically part of Antarctica. So Mount Belinda up there in 2001 started erupting violently and spewed lava down into the ocean, forming a new territory still administered by British Antarctic Survey and these days actually the Falkland Islands uh, government. So there's some Falkland Islands stamps uh, there, but but the bottom where is it? It's the bottom right picture, Mount Saunders. Uh, the top one is my own photograph from a helicopter um, flying around the crater of, of Mount Saunders. But this bottom photograph was taken by an American photographer just last year on a private mountaineering expedition in association with British Antarctic Survey Science, because the the British scientists had had looked at Mount Mount Michael a lot, and they figured maybe just maybe there's a lava lake there, because lava lakes around the world are very very Scarce. There's not very many of them. There's a couple of them in Africa, and there's Mount Erebus, as you know now. But they may well be, and they've pretty well discovered one there. And this this is this article is coming out shortly in National Geographic magazine. So look out for that. Um, yeah. So that's it's pretty exciting. What's going on? Uh, Sorry. No, don't, don't, please don't. Not. Don't do that. That people want to join. So you just told them to. Help. Sorry. <laughs> people will want to join. So if you just click. If you press the admit button, you can join it and watch it. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Continue on from the South Sandwich Islands, right across the Indian Ocean. You've got islands like Kerguelen um, and a, a whole host of, of, um, of smaller islands, all of which are volcanoes. And then you come down into the South Indian Ocean to Australia's highest peak, Big Ben, on Heard Island, which is uh, uh, just north of the of the biological convergence zone. So it's it's sort of hovering there between, but heavily glaciated, as you can see. And there's also a possibility that Big Ben has a lava lake tucked away under Mawson Peak, because it has actually been actively erupting in the last uh, in the last few years, spewing lava down the side. So cast your mind back to 1841. There was a, a whoop, that's a good idea. A very significant um, science venture that sent Royal Navy vessels, the Erebus and Terror, uh, down to Hobart, Tasmania, and then further down uh, looking for the South Magnetic Pole. And James Clark Ross had been to the Arctic with his uncle. He'd, he'd sledged with the Inuit to the North Magnetic Pole. Um, he'd learned a lot about, about sledging, particularly on sea ice. He had eight winters in the polar regions, and he had four, 14 or 15 summers in the Arctic, including attempt on the North Pole with, by, uh, with Parry, uh, before he was assigned this project of coming to Hobart and, and a quest for the South Magnetic Pole. So he had a lot of experience. So this was 60 years before the Shackleton and Scott era, uh, at the turn of the century in the 1900s. So out he came in the Erebus and Terror and magnetic observations all the way across the Indian Ocean and then he came across to New Zealand, sub-Antarctic islands as well. And he did what everybody said he could not be done. All the sealers and whalers said you will not break through the pack ice in the Ross Sea. And, but he had super strengthened his ships. He never lost a man to scurvy. <laughs> Um, but super strong military ships and used them effectively the first icebreakers. And he did batter his way through. It took him something like 30 odd days to batter through the pack ice and break into what we now call the Ross Sea, of course. And he, but he was desperately disappointed when he discovered the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, uh, many of which he named after prominent members of the Royal Society, etc. But 
um, he was desperately disappointed because he could work out from his observations that the mag South Magnetic Pole was on land in what we call North, North Victoria land today. So uh, he sailed on south, hoping to find a way around the mountains uh, to get back to the pole. Because and, and he also started looking for an anchorage because he he had the skills to anchor his winter in his ships and sledge the pole the following year. But he couldn't find anchorages at all. Kept on coming south, and then in uh, January 1841, of course, discovered. Uh, Erebus and Terra, and, and Erebus at that stage was in a violent stage of, of eruption. Um, I like this painting which I got from the Maritime Museum in Greenwich, um, because if you look carefully at it in the book, you can still see the pencil marks where the second in command of Terra, John Davis, drew them on the deck of the ship that day as he, as he outlined uh, this painting. But he must have painted, I'm guessing that he painted because of the temperatures, he must have painted it in his cabin that night, or perhaps back when they wintered back in Hobart. Uh, but I really love it because you can just see the pencil marks all over the painting. Um, Joseph Hooker was on board, and that's his painting in the bottom left there. Um, and he was proofreading uh, Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle on board. So he was a young naturalist. Uh, so it was fascinating to, to read his journals as I prepared this chapter. Um, and, but he also, all these, all these scientists um, did have a, an artistic background as well. Interestingly, Ross had a daguerreotype camera on board, which was given to him by Herschel, and Mount, Mount Herschel in North Victoria land. And Herschel was the discoverer of Uranus, and he also he was an astronomer. He also uh, coined the phrase uh, photography, and he helped develop the early daguerreotype camera. But I'm guessing because of the length of exposures that you need uh, for that sort of a camera, Ross never had the time or there was too much movement in the ship, whatever. There were no photographs from the expedition. But there's his sketch map from his log, and uh, as he named all the peaks all the way down the Victoria Land coast, including Erebus and Terra and Ross Island, didn't really recognise it as an island, um, but he, of course, eventually sailed out and discovered what we now call the barrier or the Ross Ice Shelf. But you'll see in the very top of the picture the Parry Mountains, and they that's named after uh, Parry, who he had attempted the North Pole with, but that was a mirage. They're not really mountains at all, which was finally disproved by Scott and Shackleton, who went up in a hydrogen balloon on the Discovery Expedition. They're early drawings. Um, so the top picture shows you Mount Hallett, uh, Mount Herschel on the far right. And the, the one on the left shows Mount as a first, first drawing of Mount Melbourne. And they named it Mount Etna in their log for quite a few days because they thought it was of a uh, similar shape to the volcano in, uh, uh, in Italy. But then the middle drawings, of course, show you Erebus and Terra and Mount Bird, and then the discovery of the Ross Ice Shelf. So there's James Clark Ross. He was called the handsomest man in the Royal Navy. Colin Garwood is, is a friend of mine from Nelson. He's a, a lovely, lovely painter, and he's done several series of Ross Dependency stamps in recent years. And this is his depiction of Shackleton's um, Nimrod arriving at, uh, at Cape Royds to set up their base there. So the chapter begins by introducing Shackleton in the 1901 expedition, but of course it focuses on the fact that they did the first ascent uh, with two Australian scientists, Edgeworth David, who is the oldest man on the expedition at 50 years old, and a much younger student of his, Douglas Moore, um, eventually did the first ascent of Erebus. But the top drawing in this picture is from Louis Bernacchi, the Australian physicist who'd wintered at Cape Adair um, on Borschkebing's expedition. Now, it's interesting that the, they, they, they sailed on down after their winter and they landed on the Ross Ice Shelf with dogs and they made a, uh, an attempt to go south on, on the Ross Ice Shelf. But interestingly, the Norwegians landed on Ross Island. They landed in Lewis Bay at... <clears throat> at a place called Cape Tennyson. And very luckily they survived because obviously a big chunk of ice broke off the glacier and the tidal wave swept some of the Norwegians off this plinth of rock that they were on. But, but it's just interesting that the first landing on Ross Island itself was a year before Scott's 1901 expedition. So uh, the bottom left picture there is an Edward, famous Edward Wilson painting from Hut Point, and it's lovely. They're out there on skis, and you can see the glow from the lava lake in, the, in his painting. And then the, the, the next two pictures, uh, a famous picture by Mawson of the other four on the summit after the first ascent looking down into the crater. And then uh, George Marston was the artist on Shackleton's Nimrod expedition, and that's his depiction there on the right. <clears throat> 
Of course, um, they made uh, the famous book you're aware of, The Rural Australis, a lot of which features Edgeworth David's description on that first ascent of Erebus. And if you haven't read that, I suggest you do. It's, it's a lovely, lovely description. And they certainly got hammered by really high winds and, of course, low temperatures, trying to keep premises alight, trying to keep hydrated and fed. Very difficult climb, not easy at all. Um, here they are up on the t on top left there is uh, on the top of the mountain finding some of these fumarole towers which they they liken to a, a, a lion a lion lying down an interesting novel that came out in uh, 1912 of three boys that get stranded in the Ross Sea their ship sinks and they have adventures on volcanoes but curiously of course publishers of the day weren't quite sure if there were polar bears in the, in the Antarctic or not so let's stick a polar bear on the spine of the book very common in those days. And some of the Arctic books had penguins on the spine as well. Curious. And of course, remember that Borschkevink's expedition took, took very the biggest guns they could bring because they weren't sure what sort of animals they were going to face either. They thought there may well be bears there. But the bottom picture is important, I think, because the three guys, Mackay, Edgeworth, David, and Mawson, had proved themselves on the first ascent of Erebus, and they were selected by Shackleton to, uh, to sledge to the South Magnetic Pole, which they, which they did very, sufficient, uh, very uh, efficiently across the sea ice and then inland into North Victoria and inland glaciers. But of course, the magnetic pole is constantly moving, and they they, they were pretty pretty knackered. These boys, um, were a lot of man hauling, and they eventually decided that let's actually just sit down and wait for the pole to come to us. That was as with Edward David's lines in his diary, which I really liked. <laughs> they had enough of this man hauling, but because they, they knew they had to man haul all the way back again. Well, the second ascent of Erebus was on Scott's uh, Terra Nova expedition, and the chapter ascent, so there's a, a, quite a rare auroral picture uh, over the Scott's hut there with Erebus in the background, uh, a modern-day picture. But it, the chapter focuses on Trigg of Gran, a young Norwegian who'd her, inherited quite a lot of money. He built his own ship, and he was desperate to sail to the Antarctic, but Nansen came along and convinced him, no, he shouldn't do that. He's too young. He needed to get some experience. So he teamed him up with Captain Scott, who was coming through to test his, his vehicles in Norway, uh, tracked vehicles, and uh, Gran um, impressed Scott no end with his skiing ability. And it was Scott, uh, Scott had used skis on, on the 1901 expedition, but he, they only used used one pole, which wasn't very efficient. So Trigg of Grand changed all that and started using two poles, of course. So his alpine skills and uh, skiing skills were invaluable to, uh, he, so he went on the Terra Nova expedition. So, um, but the chapter also focuses on Raymond Priestley, a scientist, and uh, Frank Debenham, a geographer, also a scientist, and uh, three of his other mates there. So, so you, you're aware of the of the epic winter story that, that Priestley had getting stuck in an inexpressible island where they'd spend the entire winter in a snow cave. Um, so they eventually survived that winter. They sledged all the way back down to Cape Evans Hut, desperate for food. They spent three weeks eating, eating, eating. Uh, they knew that Scott was dead. The search parties who'd been out, Trigger of Grand had been out on the search parties. They knew that Scott was dead. Um, anyway, the, three weeks after they got back, they set off on the second ascent of Erebus with Trigger of Grand. The, the technical expert, and uh, so it's a it's an interesting story. And Trigg of Graham, when he came back from the expedition, uh, climbed Mount Cook. So he certainly was no turkey. He came back and learned to fly under the French uh, aviator Louis Blériot. He bought a plane from him and flew for the Royal Air Force in the second, in the First World War. You you'll read his biography in the background. It's interesting. But I focus on on Priestley and Debenham because in the, here's a picture on the top there of Debenham doing some plane table surveying on the. Uh, on the second ascent of Erebus, um, and you, he did some uh, very beautiful maps, um, which were published in 1922-23. And importantly, Debenham and Priestley, uh, they came down from Erebus to Cape Royds. They used some of the letterhead paper that Shackleton left behind it, and they wrote down point by point of what they conceived and what is now the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge, England. Um, so that's an important part of that story. So there's Debenham's uh, plane table surveying of the summit craters of Erebus. The third ascent was in 1959 with John Harrison, Wally Romanes, and uh, Alan Beck, who went on to quite an illustrious career as a volcanologist here in New Zealand. Um, John Harrison was a, a young mountaineer, and they did, they already had done the first ascent of Mount Discovery uh, in '59. When, uh, their party to North Victoria and wasn't successful; they couldn't land on the icebreaker, so they ended up at Scott Base, and so they made the third ascent of, of Erebus. Um, but I'd seen other black and white images. Um, 
from the arrival back at Scott Base with a sail up mounted on the sledge because they skied Erebus and, and sailed the sledge all the way down. But I'd sit, they were only black and whites. And I inherited Arnold Heine's Antarctic pictures a few years ago after Arnold passed away. And I whittled it down to a hundred important images. And there was one of them in colour, which was some, so this was taken in, in uh, 1959. So my early, very early Kodachrome image. It took, because this, Wellington is the worst possible environment to store colour slides in terms of fungus and, and whatnot. Uh, it took me days to clean the, all the fungus off that image to make, make it workable in the book. Uh, John Harrison eventually died on Mount Rolleston in a rescue. He was killed in an avalanche. But he was a lovely pastel painter. He was, he was an artist in Christchurch. And there's some of the early stamps that you'd be familiar with, I'm sure, from the TAE, with Erebus focused on that Thrippany stamp. Through the 1960s, focus on people like Bill Lucy, who climbed Erebus twice in one year in, in 1967. And one of those ascents was with Carlo Mori, a famous Italian mountaineer. Um, New Zealand uh, supported four Italian expeditions uh, before they signed the Antarctic Treaty and eventually went on to build their own Antarctic base at Terranova Bay. So Carlo Mori was uh, part of that group. And of course, as you're familiar, as you're well aware, um, as the 1960s um, went on, dogs were increasingly left behind and uh, skidoos were taking over. So the top picture there shows a geology party uh, about to head off using uh, skidoos and sledges with the dogs dogs left behind. But So if, for all those who have lived at Scott Base, um, Erebus is a constant friend, a familiar sight every day when you get outside the base. And... Uh, but come along the 1970s and Phil Kyle, as Peter mentioned, had done his PhD in Antarctica and he decided that really he needed to work. It was just obvious that work needed to be done on an exciting volcano to extend the science that these early boys had done. So in those days, the in the late, uh, in the very early 70s, the helicopters were not really powerful enough. So it was a, a very significant logistic problem to get people up there. Um, New Zealand had quite a number of significant evacuations off the summit of, of Erebus with altitude sickness, because it's although it's just higher than Mount Cook, because of the flattening of the atmospheres at the polar regions, it's the equivalent altitude of about 16,000 feet. So you fly from zero at Scott Base to 16,000 feet and you've got altitude sickness problems kicking in straight away. So it didn't take very long after these evacuations that the American pilots said, this is crazy, uh, well, you've got to go to an intermediate camp to acclimatise for three or four days first. The pilots are on oxygen, the payload for the helicopter is reduced, etc. So it was quite a, a complicated equation to get scientists and support them up on top of Erebus. So this chapter and that covers the whole of the 1970s. So here's Werner Gigenbach that I mentioned. Um, uh, he was desperate. He's a, he was a geochemist, and he was desperate to get close to the lava lake and some of the active fumaroles there to collect gas samples uh, to analyse the gas coming out of, of Erebus. And he had collected samples from the outside of the volcano, of course, but they were very quickly contaminated by air and water vapour, and hence his motivation and incredible determination um, to get close as possible to the lava lake. So you can see titanium rods there sticking out of the back of his rucksack, and there's a belay rope on the on the left hand side. A 1974, this is 1978. A 1974 expedition um, was a, a major expedition involving uh, a lot of French scientists as well that, that uh, Phil Kyle had invited along, and they used heavy metal winches that the French were familiar with from the from their work in Middle Africa uh, with Harun Taziev. But it was they were just too heavy to, to manhandle. Uh, to get into the inner, into the main crater floor, um, and, the, and just too cold and too stiff to operate. So in '78 we went back to just using conventional nylon ropes, not nylon climbing ropes, even though there was an obvious danger of them melting with molten lava flying around the place, which is indeed what happened. When so I, I ended up being the. I ended up being, well, this just gives a feel for um, difficult environment. Um, here's, Harun, it's very hard for me to point. 
um, Harun Taziev there in the black shirt. Toasty. He, brought, he, he was employed by the French government to, as a troubleshooter around the French territories to make decisions on major volcano eruptions in places like Martinique, uh, to, whether we evacuate 100,000 people or not, if, if things are going crazy. So we're drinking Martinique rum there in, in the hut of Erebus, and it was Phil Kyle that convinced National Science Foundation to build that little hut in the background there, and you can already see the stars and stripes getting torn to shreds. So we still lived in polar tents, um, but in, in the early 70s, it was was really hard to, to melt enough snow to stay hydrated. A lot of the snow is painted with sulfur and chemicals and whatnot, so it's hard to stay hydrated. You can only work for about a six-hour day, um, and it's too exhausting. So a hut changed all that, especially for people like Ray Dibble, who were setting up seismic seismometers around the crater rim to, to monitor it. And here he is in Scott Base uh, receiving some of those signals from these seismometers. So the hut was a game changer in terms of cooking and easier living and eating and whatnot, but it also kept his batteries warm because up till then he could only keep the batteries inside those fumaroles and bury them in some of the warm soil. And so it was kind of Mickey Mouse thing for Ray. He worked his butt off, a really dedicated guy that changed a lot of the thinking about what was going on and how this volcano was working. But this is Ray's tent here, and I'm getting sworn at because I'm supposed to be holding the other end of the tent. The tent had blown away. We'd lost sleeping bags and mattresses. So here we are trying to repitch the uh, repitch the tent, and that's Ray there in the background. Yeah, good guy. So here's Harun that I've mentioned. He wrote two books on Erebus. Um, the bottom left picture shows uh, Rendezvous with the Devil. It was a film that he was nominated for, an, I think it was an Emmy or an Oscar, I'm not sure, on some of his crazy adventures in African volcanoes. And here's, here he is here in an African volcano covered and spattered in, in volcanic uh, lava and whatnot with a guy called uh, Francois Laguerre, whose nickname was Fan Fan. So you'll meet Fan Fan a little bit later on. But he came to Erebus several times. Um, yeah, but Harun was um, in his late 60s by the time he came to Erebus in 74, and then I dealt with him in 76, 76 and 78, and he was still playing rugby for the old boys of France at the time, and I caught up with him one day limping on the scree slopes going up to the summit, and I said, what, what's wrong, Harun? Are you affected by the altitude? Are you getting tired? He said, no, no, I was, in the, I was in the marquee. I was in the French underground in the Second World War, and we were out shooting rabbits for food, and I stumbled and I shot half my foot off with a shotgun. <laughs> he was a hard boy, but passionate about his science. He grew up with Jacques Cousteau and the famous French mountaineer Lionel Touré, and they were very... Um, Cousteau and, and Tazieff were two people that were not allowed to be interviewed live on French television because of their anti-nuclear views. So here's me. I was the guinea pig on the left here to test the rope system in 78 with a bunch of mountaineers. There's Phil Kyle here in the white helmet. Um, so after I went down and um, um, I was very happy to, uh, the place is, is vibrating, there's a strong smell, although I've got 2,000 degree lava at my front, I've got ice and snow at my back, so it was a, a incredible contrast of, of temperatures, the whole place is, is vibrating, really noisy, you can hardly hear radio transmissions back up to my friends 80 to 90 metres above me. Um, and it, I wish I'd worn crampons. The snow was, was sufficiently hard, even though I'm close to a lava lake, sufficiently hard, because by then I was trying to uh, do what's called a tension traverse on the ropes to get across to the fumaroles that, that I knew that Werner wanted to get to. So anyway, I eventually said, enough's enough. Erebus hadn't erupted for 13 or 14 hours at that stage. I thought, pushing my luck, I'm out of here. Let's, so, I was, so the system worked, and it was just a rope system with pulleys, a bit like mountaineers used to winch people out of crevasses. Uh, on a glacier. Anyway, you've seen the picture of, of there's Haroon on the left, on the right there, gearing up with these titanium rods to go down. So here's Ray Dibble's picture on the top left there of uh, it, did, it, it erupted, to cut it a long story short, while Werner was down in there. And we thought for sure he'd be um, uh, knocked unconscious at the very least, possibly killed outright. Uh, molten bombs were landing all around us. We're on the main crater floor here. Some of them the size of um, a Zodiac, the size of this desk or whatever. So here's uh, Verno at the end of the day, looking very disgruntled, sitting in, on top of a, a rapidly cooling bomb. And we broke into that 24 hours later. You could still see it glowing bright red. Um, eventually, Verno started replying to our radio, desperate radio communications. And there's a picture on the top uh, right there of um, the burnt rope. So some of the lava had landed on the nylon ropes. Fortunately, it hadn't burned through, obviously. Some of the lava landed on his woolen trousers, but he, with his leather gauntlets, he could brush it off um, so he wasn't injured at all. And that's as close as anybody has got to uh, 
um, those fumaroles. Um, uh, lighter moments on, on Erebus. Kathy Cashman was a, uh, an American scholar who did a master's here at Victoria University, and Harry Keyes, who did his PhD on salts and McMurdo Sound, but a lot of that was involved in Erebus, and he's continued to work on Erebus right through for many years, even though he was still he was working for Doc by that stage. Just lighter moments, heading out on the, onto the outer rims and things, looking south towards Mount Discovery. Kathy there is uh, not really playing a guitar. It was too cold for that, but she'd buried our Christmas dinner in silver foil and newspaper, and we buried it for three days inside the hot soil and cooked our Christmas dinner. We don't do that anymore because it uh, is potentially introducing um, bacteria or whatever to uh, a pristine environment. So the next year, of course, was 79, and um, so there's my own photograph from the top of Mount Terra, and it just highlights, um, and I can't even point it out, can I? I'm not sure. No. Anyway, the aircraft really didn't hit Erebus at all. It hit the, hit the base of, of Ross Island. New Zealand had just finished a very, very difficult drilling program in McMurdo Sound that it was underfunded and under-resourced in many ways. And it was it stretched Cop Base to the limit. And uh, the, the leader of Cop Base, Mike Preble, um, was at his wit's end. And 10 days later, of course, the aircraft hit. So it was a hell of a season for the, the, everybody running Scott Base, and especially landing on the shoulders of Mike Preble. Um, so he he ran a very, very good operation, handling dozens and dozens of people coming south from, from New Zealand uh, to sort out uh, the issue there. So a top image of our camp that we eventually set up in blowing snow, uh, and in the bottom picture there's uh, body flags being organised. So again, if you look at that top picture, you're looking uh, due north, and there's that Beaufort Island again. So I won't go into the whys and wherefores of the whole crash, but Beaufort Island plays a very large role in the, the, the photographs which we eventually picked up from the passengers' cameras. Um, there's one of the aircraft engines on, on the left there. And eventually the, the Scott Base guys, Garth Varco, they're holding the, the, the Memorial Cross outside Scott Base. And everybody in McMurdo, the community of 1,000 people or so at McMurdo, and everybody at Scott Base, 100 plus people, all had a hand in that cross. Everybody uh, put some varnish or linseed on. I can't, remember whether it was, I can't remember if it was linseed or varnish, but I think it was linseed because we had linseed for the Nansen sledges. Um, so everybody went through the sledge room and put... Um, a coat of uh, oil onto the Memorial Cross before it was taken up to the crash site, but it eventually blew away. Um, and they've made a smaller metal one now, which is in situ today. Um, I purposely turned all the images in this chapter into black and white for a number of reasons, but I wanted this concluding picture by an Australian artist, Peter Norville, um, that I found quite by chance, and I, I dialed him up. On, he lives on a farm in Australia. He'd been a commercial aircraft pilot for 30 years. He's retired now, but he's a, a full-time painter, and he uh, he followed the crash um, quite closely, of course, but this is his depiction of the first moment of the aircraft hitting the volcano. So you've got a lava lake up on the top of the picture and wheels flying flying off the aircraft. Um, the, the lead light window there is from the cathedral in Auckland, and you've got a file of uh, relatives of the deceased uh, filing up the stairway there. The book also covers quite a number of private expeditions that have come to Ross Island, um, and this most famous one, uh, the Footsteps of Scott expedition in 1985. Primarily their aim was to uh, ski to the South Pole, which the three of them did, um, but it's a very long, complicated chapter in terms of the support that they had or didn't have from uh, their own aircraft and their own ship, which eventually sank. But uh, in terms of Erebus, um, Roger Meir was a professional mountaineer. He'd done some very significant climbs in, in Alaska and in the Himalayas and Europe. Um, he was part of the ski party. He was the brains behind the expedition, and he soloed uh, Erebus in, in winter. So here's the Southern Cross, their vessel in Littleton Harbour, setting out in 19, late 1984. And there's Robert Swan up there with uh, Bill Burton, who was the last surviving member at that time of the Terranova expedition. He was a stoker um, saying farewell to the expedition. And the bottom picture there is, is uh, Roger Meir. <laughs> um, 
the chapter finishes with um, the fact that they had to leave their base. They built a base at Cape Evans, very close to the historic hut, as you can see. And then eventually they had to abandon that base after the ship sank. And there's the, in the bottom right there is the ship sinking near Beaufort Island. Um, Anyway, Greenpeace eventually agreed to, uh, they did have a second winter in the hut, but Greenpeace eventually took over their base and agreed that they would remove it when Greenpeace, after their five winters on Ross Island, they removed everything from, from their occupation, including the footsteps of Scott. So here's Roger Meir working out, uh, plotting his route and whatnot to ski to the pole. And so there's a few sidebars in the book, and I mentioned Fanfan before, the French scientist. Um, he came back with uh, a famous uh, French um, medical doctor, but also adventurer, Jean-Louis Etienne, who'd skied to the North Pole. But he conceived of uh, traversing Antarctica with dogs. So he teamed up with the American Will Steger, and they inherited New Zealand's Scott-based dogs as well. And four of those of our dogs uh, crossed the continent, 7,000 kilometres of sledging in seven months, uh, the fourth cross of Antarctica. And uh, so Jean Louis Etienne, he built a $20 million yacht uh, for this to support this expedition. They used it subsequently for French television to educate children about Antarctica. And uh, it was called Antarctica, the yacht. It was like a battleship. And he sailed it um, south, uh, eventually from Hobart, into the Ross Sea. It was the first sail-powered vessel since James Clark Ross to go south of Cape Hallett. And they landed at Cape Royds, and they had skidoos, and they drove up to the Fang Glacier on Erebus, and their scientists went up there, and they put ropes right across the craters and whatnot, and they rigged up a complicated pulley system, and Fan Fan came back and lowered gas sampling bottles into the fumaroles and things. So you read all that on a sidebar. But the, the yacht is interesting because it eventually was bought by Peter Blake. And, of course, as you well know, Peter Blake was murdered on the vessel. And the, the boat was then eventually bought by another French expedition, and it's now called the Tara. And it was frozen into the Arctic a few years ago and a skippered by um, a Kiwi called Grant Redvers. And they did a Nansen frozen fro – they froze the yacht in and drifted. So it was a science expedition across the Arctic ice on that very same yacht. Fantastic vessel. Um, in 1990, no, no cruise vessel had been into the Ross Sea twice in one season. So when my Australian friend who, was, who had started Clark Expeditions and I were in Hobart after a voyage to Mawson's Hut, and we realised that we were going twice into the Ross Sea, and we had a helicopter on board, um, which we'd used at Mawson's Hut, and we thought, hmm, we, were, we wanted to climb in the dry, well, Mike wanted to climb in the dry valleys, and I wanted to climb Erebus on the first ascent route from Cape Royds. So we thought, we can't climb in the dry valleys without a helicopter. We need a pilot, and we need 60,000 US dollars. So we went down the corridor to a Japanese film crew, and, and Mitsuaki Wago is the David Attenborough of Japan. He had his own television program, similar to what you've seen of Attenborough's. And we said, look, do you want to get off the ship with us for three weeks? We get off on one voyage, and we get picked up on the second voyage. And he said, oh, yeah, we, we need $60,000. So he, went, he said, just a minute, I'll phone my producer in Tokyo. And 10 minutes later, we had $60,000. We had a pilot, we had a helicopter, and we got off the ship. We spent the whole voyage south getting all that. We ran around Hobart buying all sorts of gear because the American and New Zealand programs had shut down by that stage. And there was, so there's no chance of rescue. There was no aircraft flying. All the pilots had gone home, et cetera. So if anything gone wrong, we would have had to winter at Cape Royds. Or if we got stuck in the dry valleys, if the helicopter had flipped over or whatever, we'd have been, we'd have been isolated. We were the only people in the entire trans Antarctic Mountains. It was very exciting period, um, but the, there was no latitude for error, that's for sure. So here's the Frontier Spirit with a helicopter and a base camp at Cape Royds near Shackleton's Hut. And here we are in the Olympus range and we changed to the, uh, the Asgard range later on. We, so we climbed some easy peaks and then eventually we climbed uh, climbed Erebus. So you can see the, the summit hut is, is still there, of course, but it's the, the acid in the in the gases have totally changed the colour from orange and, and just burnt it off. And I, I mentioned at this point the difficulty of this environment. That hut is totally blown away. It no longer exists. It was totally destroyed by the wind. And, and as you see later on, they, they built a second hut lower down in a safer place. But that hut was totally demolished by the wind. The, the last two, the second, the, the couple of chapters, I, was, I, was, I wanted to do all the modern science from 1980 right through to 2020 in one chapter, and it, was, it just got too big, so I eventually broke it down into the biology chapter, the microbiology uh, inside the fumarole towers and the warm ground, um, and then the second, the second chapter focuses on the volcanology, so... Uh,
So you're looking across McMurdo Sound there, across the Sea of Cloud, and that's the Royal Society range in the background. There's 4,000 metre summits um, on the skyline. So there's the lower hut. There's the new hut, which I haven't been to. That was built by National Science Foundation under Phil Kyle's uh, auspices. And as Peter said, Phil Kyle's had 44 expeditions, 44 years he's worked on Erebus. And in 2016, I think was his last year, I don't think he's now got funding for that. But as you can see, it's quite a big spacious hut and quite luxurious uh, living. It's certainly slightly lower. Uh, more powerful helicopters. Here we are bringing in underslinging fuel um, to keep the hut warm, uh, et cetera. And here's, uh, here's Harry Keyes again on the right-hand side there um, that you met earlier. So getting inside these fumarole towers, mapping them, um, extracting uh, bacteria and uh, primitive plants, algae and whatnot from the warm soil. These days, the scientists are suited up in their uh, uh, sterile suits and whatnot. Uh, some of the some of the abseils and, and lowers into the into the fumaroles are quite quite difficult. So these are just escape vents for for the gases. And um, Craig Carey, an American, but he's been living at Waikato University for quite a number of years now. Um, he's been working on sea ice. He's worked on bacteria in the dry valleys. He's worked on Erebus before, but he's going up there this season, and they're going to drill um, into into the into the walls of, of some of these fumarole tiles. I think this picture. Oh, they, anyway, they're going to drill into some of these walls to extract layers of bacteria, which essentially have never been looked at before anywhere in the world, quite unique bacteria that they're discovering. Um, so watch this watch this space from Craig Carey. Here we are, on, here's, here's Craig Carey on the bottom right there with, with a sort of a powered drill uh, in an earlier version, drilling into those uh, fumarole towers. So this chap here, chapter 12, um, focuses on uh, on the volcanology and takes you right through the Ray Dibble years of the, the seismic work, getting more and more sophisticated um, work and eventually satellite work. Um, uh, NASA have brought, did bring uh, Dante, the robot, um, and tried to control it from Maryland in the United States. Um, it didn't quite work. In fact, the Dante, as you can see, it's, it's a three meter long um, robot with its own independent legs and, and system that was capable of going down a vertical wall and then eventually taking gas samples, etc. But it didn't uh, it didn't work completely. The coaxial cable broke and wasn't a success. NASA said it wasn't a success. And a lot of this, a lot of these scientists that are now working on Erebus, they've gone on to significant careers. Um, on uh, with NASA, and some of them, Aaron Curtis for one, they're now driving uh, rovers on Mars every day. That's their sort of routine job, driving these remote vehicles on Mars. Pretty exciting. Um, the top guy there in, in the orange jacket, um, um, Clive Oppenheimer, who's, who's English, he's had 13 seasons on Erebus, and he's... Um, He's written several wonderful books on volcanoes all around the world. He's teamed up with a filmmaker, Werner Herzog, and made some terrific documentaries on volcanoes that you can watch on YouTube. Uh, really, really exciting stuff. And here's Aaron Curtis here experimenting with digging uh, machines into the warm soil to run batteries. And they weren't totally successful, but at least they kept a lot of the instruments going. Uh, when the solar panels kick out, when the light the light drops off in the, in the autumn. They need to keep some of the instrumentation going. So uh, these these um, machines kept the batteries. They, they didn't exactly charge the batteries, but they didn't enable them to run down. So they were able to get um, results right through the winter. And one of one of Clive's job was if you can't if you can't get into the the heart of the volcano because it's too dangerous, then you wait for the volcano to come to you. And as I said, Erebus blows up. So this bottom left picture shows uh, after after Clive and uh, Aaron have broken into a, a bomb on the side of uh, side of Erebus, and they're measuring various gases and temperatures and whatnot from a molten bomb. Um, Holmes Miller was, Bob Miller was a surveyor, and, and I have enormous respect for surveying through the 60s and 70s. Um, 
surveying's changed significantly now around the world, of course, but a terrible, terrible job. The other people I had enormous respect for were the, were the mechanics at Scott Base, a desperately difficult job with the, the quality of vehicles that Scott Base had in those days. But anyway, Peter Otway, um, there in that picture there on the summit of Erebus, came back as an elder statesman, if you like, as a surveyor, of course, with Wally Herbert down the Axel Heiberg Glacier and with, with dogs and whatnot. But he came back to Erebus for three or four seasons and uh, did, did a variety of, of work up there on surveying. So I worked with a, quite a number of different lens and survey surveyors uh, in various parts of Ross Dependency, but also on Erebus as, as well. So, uh, but here's Phil Pyle. Um, he's, because his birthday's in that, in that summer period, he's had well over 40 birthdays on Erebus. So here he is uh, cutting into a volcano cake. I knew right from the outset that I was going to cover art of Erebus, the art of Erebus, right throughout the book. And you've, you've already seen uh, George Marston and uh, Edward Wilson, um, a raft of people, Sean Garwood. Right through the book, there's, uh, there's art. But I, I immediately thought it seems very logical to conclude the book with a, a specific chapter on art. So I knew Adele Jackson, who's uh, a young English woman who's based at Canterbury University. She was just finishing a PhD on Antarctic art. And I had a beer with her and I said, Adele, please, would you write would you research and write a chapter specifically on Erebus? Uh, so that's what she did uh, very beautifully, I think, very powerfully. And as an aside, the uh, the air crash chapter, I wasn't sure what one person could actually get across, uh, for, especially 43 years after the crash. So I had a brainwave one night and I thought, I'll dial up three other friends, Hugh Logan, Harry Keyes and Rex Hendry, your president. Um, I dialed them up and said, look, can you give me your reflections, your impressions of that recovery operation 43 years ago? So four of us contribute to that chapter. I should have mentioned that earlier. But indirectly, Adele, as, like, like wars and various major events anywhere in the world in history, it sparked off creativity and art and especially poetry. And so Adele is very – so Adele's chapter is not just painting art. It covers – all sorts of art forms from, from song and dance and plays and and, uh, and poetry. And so I think her contribution to the air crash chapter, because there was a significant number of poetry books and poems written about the air crash, notably Bill Manhire here in, in Wellington, of course. Anyway, she, I feel she's the fifth contributor to that air crash chapter. But uh, for those of you who have read the science fiction book, The Mountains of Madness, uh, which was written by an American science fiction writer in 1936, um, it starts on Ross Island with two ships coming in, and they have aircraft. It's sort of centred around, well, the 1930s, uh, the Admiral Byrd sort of era. So they had Admiral Byrd-type aircraft, but they go into the Transantarctic Mountains and then all hell breaks loose and they discover all sorts of weird science fiction-y type things. But anyway, Erebus is erupting and whatnot. And a Spanish painter who I just found by Googling um, – he had, this is his vision of the Mountains of Madness. So this is the opening. Each chapter begins with a double-page spread, as you've undoubtedly realised by now. So this is the Spanish painter's uh, uh, version of uh, the Mountains of Madness boys coming in with their ships to Ross Island. <laughs> Hilarious. This, this is interesting. This is an English artist, Sally Gould, and it's called a perigon. Now, you, you draw a painting, uh, squiggles on, on a, on a looks like squiggles to me anyway, on a piece of paper, but you then put a spherical orb on top of it and you see the reflection. So that's this is her Erebus is reflected in, in her perigon view of Erebus. So from modern art like that through to this painting down here by uh, uh, Yasoda, I contracted in the 1980s to, uh, to do that for me. And you've got famous New Zealand painters like Austin Deans here. But even um, back in the 1860s, there was various versions of, of Erebus painted for various um, Sunday at home type illustrated magazines. Just gives you some idea of the art in, in Adele's chapter. Here's Griffith Taylor, a geologist with Scott. This is his personal book plate. Um, with Erebus behind there, of course. But and then this dark side of the plume is a takeoff, of course, of the uh, the Pink Floyd um, album cover. And this is a painting that was done, and it's still framed in the mess hall at McMurdo. And but unfortunately, the publishers wouldn't let me put it in the book because they thought there'd be endless copyright problems or whatever. But I did like it, the dark side of the plume. But interestingly, this the the, the top couple, Michael Carroll and Rosalie Lopez, have both worked on Erebus on the top um, there. And and that's their painting of um, 
of the fumarole towers, but but up on Neptune. And because Rosalie is an interesting person, she's discovered more volcanoes in the world, or well, not in our world, in extraterrestrial world, on uh, on Jupiter and Neptune than anybody on the planet. So she's a what I don't know, she's called astro physicist or something. I'm not sure, but anyway, she's combined with Michael Carroll, the artist, to to come up with that work. But, Oh, I really like this. Edward Wilson, of course, painted the famous menu that all of the expedition members signed in 1911 at uh, Cape Evans. And then uh, in 2011, so uh, 100 years later, Julie Urich at Scott Base created this, essentially the same idea with the Winter Over Party signing the menu. So those images are side by side in the book. There's been a number of other books written about Erebus. Um, the Thunder of Erebus is a is sort of a, a Russian-American uh, war-type drama. Tim Stanley Robinson is a, is a well-known science fiction writer who's worked in Antarctica under the National Science Foundation Artists and Writers Grants. And uh, he was he was interestingly uh, interviewed by Kim Hill just a couple of weeks ago. Um, some very interesting, really worth dialing up that podcast if you haven't. But anyway, Erebus comes into his story, Antarctica. But the most recent one by an American author, uh, Erebus and Apocalyptic Thriller, um, Stephen Bird, is fascinating because it takes place, it starts off inside those fumarole towers in, in Erebus, and the scientists bring down samples of these bacteria and things, the same sort of stuff that Craig Carey is going to bring and it, it gets loose at McMurdo and it causes all sorts of havoc eventually all around the world. It's quite a gripping story actually, but it begins on the summit of Erebus. So I really like, but I really like the painting on the cover and I dialed him up in the United States because it's been so successful. It's had four or five different covers, but I said, no, that's the cover I want because it's in, you're actually inside those, those fumarole caves on Erebus. So I eventually tracked that down for the book. And just a, a reminder that um, satellite technology has changed everything uh, in terms of um, some of the work that's going on in volcanoes all over the world. And so has uh, drone technology, of course. But um, here's, here's just a satellite, a relatively recent satellite view of Erebus looking vertically down and just to give you some idea uh, of the lava lake there. Um, up in the top of the picture is this uh, old caldera rim uh, called the Fang, and that's where we acclimatize. We go up there for two or three days before we get flown up onto the summit so that we don't get sick. And just a final view there of, of Scott Base, which is about to rapidly change. That entire base will be demolished, so they say, um, because the new base will be built on the same footprint. which I find kind of sad in a way because all the years that I worked at Scott Base, the 10 summers, we had nowhere to assemble field parties equipment except the hangar, which was freezing cold. Um, and now in, in modern years, they've got this, the Hillary Field Centre, which is a big box of a, of a place, but it's a wonderful warm environment for scientists to prepare their equipment before they go into the field. And that's going to go as well, which is I, I find pretty amazing. But anyway... Just a final thank you to the Antarctic Society that were um, modern modern publishing in certainly in New Zealand uh, requires significant injection of money or the publisher just can't make the financial equation work. So I needed to find sixteen thousand dollars and more. Um, I had to buy pictures from museums in Scott Polar Research and Greenwich, etc. And that money came from your society. And indeed, Antarctica and New Zealand, the New Zealand Alpine Club, Federated Mountain Clubs, Caravan Media, the Trans-Antarctic Association, both here in Wellington and in England, and the Bird Memorial Trust here in Wellington. And a big thanks to, to Peter that uh, helped organise some of the paperwork to do with those, those grants. So uh, the book would not have been possible without the support of, uh, of your society. So uh, thank you very much. Very, very happy to answer any questions, if there are any. Well, there are a lot of questions, and I think a lot of them will be personal questions. So I think you, you've given us a fantastic hour or so to talk. It's really <laughs> great. And what I think the best way is to leave those who 
got a burning question to address to Colin to come and talk to him sure. personally rather sure. than open it up to lots of questions. I mean, it's been a, it's been a, a fascinating talk, Colin. I was uh, I mean, I looked up at Erebus in the, in the 1960s when I went down, um, my, mainly doing ship stuff there, not working in Antarctica. So it was familiar territory to me, and it was really nice to to um, hear a whole bunch of names of people I, I knew. I actually came back from there with Carlo Mora on, on, on a ship, and then and at one stage when I worked at GNS, I had the um, pleasure, or should we say challenge, of, of ultimately being uh, manager of Werner Gegenbach. So there were some, <laughs> some interesting names along the way there. So thank you very much for that. It was yeah. really super talk. And thank you to to both um, Jan and, and, and Roger um, from the Holmes Miller side of life. It's great to have you both here as part of your family history for giving us the Holmes Miller's lectures. So I think thank you to everyone for attending and thank you, Colin, for a stimulating talk. And I'm sure it's going to lead us all off to go and look for the book. So thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>